Hello, hello, hello. My name is Madison and welcome to the Madison channel. If you are new here, please like, comment, subscribe, and press that notification bell so you know the next time I post. If you are returning, I love you. Thank you for coming back. Today, we are going to continue with our celebration of Asian American and Pacific Islander History Month, which is May. And we are going to be doing kind of a departure episode, but I think it builds on um, the episode about the Asian spa murders, the true crime in society episode about that. Um, this is a Black Girl Reacts episode, and we are going to watch two YouTube videos, one being um, a discussion about um, the model minority myth. Actually, it's a really good video um, that I was shown like a while ago about the model minority myth. Um, and this ties into the stop the Asian hate stuff and all of that stuff that was going on in 2020 due to COVID, which directly relates to the Asian spa murders, true crime and society episode we just did. And then we're going to watch a Jubilee episode, um, middle ground. Jubilee is a media company. They do YouTube videos and they have this thing called middle ground where they have two people, groups of people from opposing sides. And then, you know, that game, like that icebreaker where you come into the middle, if you like a agree about a statement and then you discuss and then you go back to your places so that's kind of the concept of the um show middle ground and they did one in the height of covid discussing the relationship between asian people and black people in this country and why it's so fraught so um yeah and i wanted to do this just to kind of round out the conversation we were having in the stop the asian hate video that i feel like um, we weren't able to fully, fully appreciate, um, all the way, um, not appreciate, but have a full conversation about it and have a whole video dedicated to it. Cause I just think it's an important topic, um, because it is an important topic. And I think the discussion about the model minority myth and things like that really goes to show the lengths at which the United States government will do anything to keep us POC from standing together and creating um, trusting relationships of solidarity. I think it also is a conversation that we need to have because I see a lot of Asian people playing into the model minority myth and it's important to know that these white people they ain't gonna save you they didn't like you they don't like you and just because you're playing into the myth doesn't mean they do like you it's you're being used as a token in order to continue to block any possibility of true equality in this country by banding together through solidarity so that being said i'm really excited about this video so we're gonna watch the first one it is a true tv um and I've never really heard of True TV. I know the guy, like, I don't, it's like a YouTube channel called True TV. Let me not get ahead of myself. A YouTube channel called True TV where, um, excuse me, they essentially, um, what is going on? I guess they explain, like, things like social phenomena type, type thing. Um, and so they did in a really quick and to the point, but really to me, well done episode on, um, the model minority myth and kind of hits on all the points that I think are really important to take away from it. Hold on. Let me get my computer charger. While also discussing why the model minority myth, uh, promotes anti-blackness in the Asian community. Um, how a lot of how the Asian community is being tokenized and used as pawns um, for white supremacist reasons and um, just different legislation that wouldn't have gotten to pass without black people that Asian people actively benefit from. Um, yeah, so I, I want to start there and then we can kind of discuss a little bit and then we'll go to the Jubilee video, which I think um, will be really great. So let me get everything all set up. Without further ado, here is the video we will be reacting to.
boy. I'm sure glad we left the pool party tray. Math homework is way more fun. <sighs> Computer, that's the first thing you've ever said that doesn't add up. <laughs> You're so studious, Computer. Trey, you could learn a thing or two from his people. They're very wise. Whoa, time out. Here we go again. TV and movies are rampant with Asian stereotypes, especially the idea that Asian people are some kind of model minority. Smart, successful, polite, obedient, and of course, inherently good at math. What's the big deal? Those are all compliments. Well, these compliments actually originated in a government propaganda campaign. And not too long ago, white Americans actually thought the exact opposite. Time in. In the mid-1800s, Americans were so hostile to Chinese people, the country passed laws banning Chinese immigration and denying their freedoms. They were stereotyped as a lazy, opium-addicted, menacing whore dubbed the Yellow Peril. I just want to pause here and say, white people are not creative with the... Um, characteristics and negative stereotypes and characteristics they put on people of co color. Lazy, they say that for Mexicans, um, they say that for Asian people in the past, they say that for black, they say that for all of us, like, uh, they say that about Native Americans, like, it's just annoying to have to fight through these, like, bullshit stereotypes that are not even creative. They're not even based in anything. It's like, you know how you know someone's lying when they, like, use the same term or use the same descriptions for people in their stories that they're telling. And it's like, this isn't adding up because you said that about this person or you said that about that person. So why do you always go to that place when you're talking about anything? And to me, it's like, if ever to see, to assume or to me, it's like, you can easily clock that whiteness is, one, a constructed thing, but also, two, complete BS by the way that they describe all people of color, all BIPOC people. It's just crazy. Like, oh, we're all lazy. We're all like, we all like drugs. We're dirty. We're smelly. Like, it's very like, uh, it's giving elementary school insults, like yo mama jokes. And it's like, why do we buy into this? Well, the truth is we try not to, but we have to. But because white people control the system, they built the system. It is for them. That's why we have to play this game with them. But it's like your insults, even though they're lame, like your insults suck, but they have re real material consequences for our livelihood. And that's what makes it suck even more. But it's just like you're lazy you're lazy it's like anytime they try to demonize a group it's like they're stinky and they're cuckoo and dumb and it's just like why can't we just get along they literally refuse that but anyway let's keep going with this video uncle sammy yeah, Uncle Sammy hasn't been such a cool uncle. Because of anti-Asian racism during World War II, the United States interned Japanese Americans in concentration camps. Hey, it's our Japanese friend Kenji from up the street. Oh, that's not your friend. That's a spy who wants to kill Americans. <laughs> uncle Sammy, why didn't you do that to German Americans in World War II? Yeah, I wonder. Because, because they're, they're white. white. But all that changed when the U.S. needed to suck up to its Asian allies during the Cold War. See, as the Soviet Union rose to power, the U.S. worried that Soviet propaganda was making communism sound dynamite. America is so racist, am I right? It's like, hey, USA, cut it out. <laughs> Woof. Guess I better have mercy on these Asians. Isn't that crazy? Sorry. I don't want to scream into this mic. The craziest part of this whole thing is that, uh, like, it's so crazy how they flip-flop how to treat us and how to represent us and how to support us, both with um, their media as well as social services and things like that, based on self-preservation, which is why the model minority myth is directly linked to white supremacy. But... 
it's just like, dude, like, just because the cold fucking war happened, now you're being nice to Asian people. And it's just like, it pisses me off because it's like feelings about uh, prejudices about individuals get can get flipped off like a switch when it's no longer beneficial to be outwardly bigoted but this world is so racist towards black people even though we are the original people the original um people period our our africa as a continent has literally the most natural resources ever that's why it's the poorest country and that's a conversation for another day and everyone in the world fucking hates us and buys into this white supremacy thing, which sucks. But with other POC, it can get flipped on and off depending on how they want to use you guys as pawns in this scheme of just being horrible people on this planet. So what another thing that points to how fake stereotypes are, race, race the construction of race even is is how quickly those sentiments ebb and flow with time. Like, even in the white, what's considered white. Like, Irish people were not considered white. Polish people were not considered white. Um, Germans were not considered white. Um, You know, Italians were not considered white until they were considered white. And that wasn't even that long ago. So when I see that as a black person, it's like, dang, like, you could just as easily switch up how you treat us and how you feel about us because you do it all the time with other POC you just fundamentally hate us so that'll never happen even though we've done nothing and other POC buy into that anti-blackness so again we we will never see that switch in our regard in our favor because it's just popular it's just great and groovy to hate black people for no reason but anyway if you ever wanted to see how how fake race is as a construction like this is one of the best examples of it so america embarked on a propaganda campaign to tout asian american success stories the state department highlighted asian american artists politicians and even sent an all chinese american basketball team on tour overseas forget all that nastiness earlier america loves our asian sports heroes and in 1965 congress approved a landmark immigration law that ditched racist restrictions but it gave preference to immigrants who had training talent or skill sets that would benefit the u.s economy okay this is where we need to pause because this is why like it annoys me when other poc are anti-black even just african immigrants as well are anti-black american it's complicated like the race and as it's a construction it's it's a complicated thing um but it pisses me off because the Immigration and Nationality Act Act of 1965 was directly related and passed because of the Civil Rights Act in 1964 and the Voting Rights Act. Okay, so I don't know if the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act, which one came first? I don't know, but one was 1964, one I think was 1965 as well. But all of these acts came around at the same time directly as a result of the push by the black community to fight for all people, no matter what color or creed, and push for equality for us. This act, where a lot of Asian Americans were able to immigrate here, um, you know, with an easier chance of getting the ability to stay here, You directly benefited from the civil rights movement, but you guys turn around and look at us and say we complain too much and we're this and we're that and we're loud and we're all of this. We fought for you. We fought for you. We fought for your right to be able to come here without restriction based on your race. That was us. You're here because of us. And you turn around and come here and buy into the model minority myth and act and turn your back on us when we need help and act like white people towards us or are just actively anti-black in your whole community. And 
say that we complain too much, but that complaining and that voice that we got literally is the one thing that allowed so many people to be able to immigrate here. I'm saying that to Asian people. I'm saying that to South Asian people. I'm saying that to all POC immigrants that came or can, their family lineage can be traced to around this time or after. Um, because you all look down on us, even freaking Africans, even Africans native to the continent look down on us. And the reality is you you came here to live this life. You judge us for living here, but you don't have to you you were able to forego a lot of the racialized experiences and discrimination and years of slavery and segregation and just uh, redlining and sabotage and the list goes on and on about all the things that we as black Americans face. You're being used to cover that up. You're being strategically used to say oh, well, if we can come here and be successful and we're not white, then what's wrong with the black people? And the reality is you don't know what we've been through and you're here because we fought for you to be here too. And we did nothing to you. So anyway, I like how they're doing this. This is such a great, like, honestly, this should be shown in schools because it, it, it teaches you a lot. But... The fact that um, the civil rights movement is directly related to why a lot of Asian Americans can trace their lineage um, to coming to America around this time, and there's still so much anti-black hate in this country, is hurtful and annoying. Borders now open for smart, successful Asian immigrants. <laughs> wow, now that I've let all these educated, successful Asians into America, I've got to say, Asian Americans sure are successful and educated. So America went from a country that despised Asians to one that held them up as a shining example of assimilation. And this self-fulfilling prophecy resulted in the model minority myth. And the most sinister part of this myth is it was used to put other minorities down and it's still holding people back today. Oh, it's our... Um, and that's another piece of it that people don't know about the immigration um, law of 1965. The U.S. government picked specific types of Asian people to come into this country. You got an easier way to get allowed to be a citizen here if you were a professional, if you were college educated in your other country that you're coming from. So you're not only picking... Um, using Asians as a token, as a shield to say, black people, what's wrong with you? But you're also picking the, the cream of the crop education-wise and professional-wise to come here to then throw it in our face and be like, why can't you guys do this? And it's like, okay, but they went to college where they're from and they were doctors and neurosurgeons and engineers where they're from. So that automatically sets them apart from the black people who have been systematically barred from access from a lot of colleges and things historically in the past who live and work and breathe America. So it's also that like very diabolical thing that the U.S. government does where it's like, what? Look at these Asian people. They're so smart and they're so educated. Wow, black people, we give you everything and this is what we get for it. Changing the narrative about racism when it's like you handpick these people to throw it in our face. You weren't picking people who were uneducated or people who were poor and poverty stricken. Like you pick people either because, you know, here we go on a rant. But um, in the case of, like, um, being Filipino or whatever, too, like, there's a pipeline uh, between America and the Philippines in terms of gaining citizenship. And a lot of that is by way of either becoming a nurse here or being a, 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 um, signing your life to the military. You know what I mean? So maybe you're not necessarily a professional or weren't a professional or whatever in your other country. But if you're willing to commit your life to being in the military, then you can come over, which again continues to promote this pro-America thing, model minority thing. Do you know what I mean? There's always strings attached that we don't 
we're not privy to and so it's annoying that the narrative the narrative ultimately always ends on the backs of black people for being this that or the third thing um negatively dumb lazy stupid unable to pull themselves by their brute steps it must be because their families are broken up or this or that and it's like we've been attacked unwarrantedly we had a completely different experience we are not immigrants here we are american citizens that were forced to be here generation after generation due to chattel slavery this country wouldn't exist without our labor okay and then we get looked at as the worst minority because we speak up for our rights and the rights of other people the most and we are trying to make even out the playing field and instead of helping us and providing a helping hand to that more often people turn their backs on us so anyway that's how insidious the government is, I'm telling you. In the 1960s, government officials looked at socioeconomic data from African-American communities and contrasted it to the so-called family values and stability of Asian Americans. Now, this fueled racist claims that black people had no one to blame but themselves if they experienced poverty and other social disadvantages. Conservatives went on to use these claims to justify making cuts to many essential social programs for African Americans and other disadvantaged minority groups. They were even used to argue against civil rights. Come on, you don't see computer complaining about fair and equal protection. Asians earned their place in this country. Why can't you? What? No, Uncle Sammy, you helped Asian people. Why can't you see that? And the model minority myth hurts Asian people too. If an Asian American student is struggling in school, many teachers assume that they don't really need extra help. And it's not true that all Asians are crazy rich and successful. <laughs> the poverty rate for Asian Americans is actually higher than the national average. And frankly, it's kind of ridiculous that we lump people from so many different backgrounds together as Asian. Okay. I just want to end this by saying, because it wasn't that good. It was like under, it's five minutes. It's like really educational. But it's also the thing of like the fact that they called him computer, which is like an informational object or tool used and controlled by whoever uses it, is very poignant. Poignant. Okay, so now we're going to go to the Jubilee middle ground. Middle ground okay I misspelled Asian are we allies black Americans versus Asian Americans I'm really excited for this help Bill I think a misconception that Asian Americans have about black Americans is that we are violent rude lazy that we don't like or respect them. George Huang woke this morning to find his mini mall burned to the ground. They just don't seem to have any respect for the black community. If anything, I'm not sure if there is enough knowledge about the Asian American culture to have a misconception, if that makes sense. One of the biggest things I wanted to address is how much anti-blackness is rooted in our culture. Sometimes it's very subtle but is very deeply rooted. Latasha Harlins, a black teenager, is shot and killed by a Korean store owner. I think they have a lot of the quote unquote good stereotypes and I feel like a lot of black people deal with a lot of bad quote unquote stereotypes. Their oppression, you know, is horrible, but Asian oppression is also horrible. You know, Asian people just want to hang out with Asian people only, like trying to talk with them or whatever. Sometimes they would just look at me and just like ignore me. My name is Lynn, I'm 30 years old, I'm an actor, and I'm also unemployed. <laughs> My name is Faith, I'm 21, and I'm currently an apprentice for a hair salon. Hi, I'm Tony, I'm 35, a digital marketer and a podcaster. Hi, my name is Regina, I'm 29, I currently work as a data engineer. Hi, my name is Taylor, I'm 25, and I currently oh work as God. a program assistant for a nonprofit. I know that girl. Weird. LA man. What's up, y'all? My name is Joseph. I am 27, and I'm an actor, musician, activist, and looking for work. <laughs> I care about being accepted by white America. 
Hmm? Being accepted in white culture um, means, I, I guess, I'm not like discriminated in, in a heavy way. And I think there is a level of comfort that I take in that. Um, not that that doesn't mean I'm like going against like any other culture, but it, there is a comfort level. And I think it's a privilege that I have that I'm able to be looked that way, even though I'm a minority. Yeah, I think um, it's a sad reality that I have to sit here, literally only because I think currently white America runs our society mm -hmm. and our system. Right. And in order for me to benefit myself, my family, I need to align with that sometimes. It actually gives me great anxiety when I step into a situation and I know I'm the only POC because then suddenly I am in my head as to how should I act to have a normal conversation. A lot of the times when I'm in a group setting when everybody's Asian, especially Asian people who only have Asian friends. 100%, I know exactly what you're talking about, yeah. I get this weird feeling that now you're gonna label me as the white one. <laughs> And I hate that wow. because yeah. I'm not white. Yeah. It's just a really weird identity crisis. It's the first time in my life I've heard someone say exactly what I've been feeling for my entire life. But yeah, that's exactly how I feel about that. Okay, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, do I, The question or the statement was, um, I care about being accepted by white America. I find it really interesting that only people from the Asian side stepped up. And you want to know why? because they have the option to be accepted. We don't. It doesn't matter if we're the richest. I mean, look at what happened to Will Smith with the slap. They canceled his ass quickly, swiftly, okay? So it doesn't matter if you're the richest black person, if you're the fucking president of the United States. They will do anything they can to try and cancel you, to try and catch you up. Oh, he was, he was born in Nigeria. He was born in Kenya. He's not an American citizen. Whatever they did to Obama... This country will never accept me. I know that. So I don't put stock in it, but they do because it does make a difference in their life. If I cared, it wouldn't make a difference because catch the right cop on the wrong day doesn't matter if I have a million white friends in high places, doesn't matter because it just takes that initial um, prejudice to make a split decision that you can't take back, which happens so much to black people in this country. So I find, I'm already finding it really interesting the behaviors that are being expressed. Um, and that statement alone was telling. It's about having the option. And a lot of other POC have the option too, to play into whiteness. Um, I feel like black people are the only ones that know that no matter how much you play the game, it doesn't matter because it really happens to us the most. But a lot of other POCs, like, they like to play this game and the game that these two play. And the reality is respectability politics, no matter it's for a black person, if it's for an Asian person, it's if it's for an indigenous person, if it's for a Latinx person, it doesn't matter because the white people still are going to protect the whiteness and white supremacy over everything at all costs. Um, but you can choose to play the game. But this is why there's a lot of distrust between especially these two groups. Um, the most um, disadvantaged group racially is black people. And the most lifted up um, group racially that are POC are Asian people typically. And then people fall somewhere in between. And um, this is why there's distrust, because you're playing the game, so how can we trust that you actually want to build solidarity? Do you know what I mean? Let's continue. You release yourself from the shackles of that, because you're never going to be, and it, it, I understand, but you're never going to be accepted. That's how they've set this country up. And like, as a black woman, I gave up on that a long time ago, because I know I'll never be accepted. <laughs> yep. I, I'll be honest. <laughs> Statement is I have stereotyped the other side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um I think Asian people are cool personally, right? Like I'll try to like hang with them or because I, I love learning culture. 
So I'll try to like go and have conversations or whatever. And sometimes it's just been like this more like standoffish, like this is our group and you know, we have our own like little thing going on. And so I feel like for me, I was like, what, what, like what, what's up with that, right? And so yeah, I mean, I've, I've definitely had that pop into my head because yeah. it's something that you hear and then when you see it, it's like your brain automatically just pulls up that stereotype, you know? Um, I grew up in a predominantly East Asian neighborhood, Arcadia in San Gabriel Valley. But there's still this group of like old white families there. They would say things and I would, back in middle school, like I would kind of repeat it, not really understanding, like, oh, Asians are bad drivers. I'd be like, oh yeah, Asians are bad drivers. And then I'm like, no, that's really racist. Would I feel comfortable about somebody saying something like that about black people? Like, no, I wouldn't. So I kind of had to like correct myself. My parents didn't hang out with anybody else than themselves because mm -hmm. it, it's that immigrant mentality. You kind of stick with each other to bring each other up because you feel as if you're other. You want yeah. to succeed in America. So if you've got a friend who is a mechanic, you need your car fixed, you're gonna oh, go to yeah. that guy because you speak the same language. And so you're around the same kind of people. Mm -hmm. I think that that definition of other is really scary because when you don't know what that other is, you start to make up what you think that might be and that could be completely wrong. Now, I liked what she said because it kind of explained so much. A lot of the Asian presence here um, obviously is through immigration and immigrants, there's, there's an immigrant culture. My grandparents immigrated here. My grandpa immigrated here, I believe in the 50s. Um, he became a doctor, he's Jamaican. My grandma immigrated here and she was a nurse. Um, they're both Jamaican. And so, and they hung out with basically nothing but West Indian people and West Indian Seventh-day Adventist people at that. So think about how small that community is, all right? So um, all their closest friends, all the people that my parents, that my mom was allowed to interact with um, and sleep over with, their, her aunts and uncles and stuff, were all West Indian immigrants who were Seventh-day Adventists who were in some sort of, usually in some sense of the medical profession, so even smaller, technically. And um, so what she's describing is an immigrant mentality, which isn't bad, because I get it, it's scary. You're coming here not knowing what's going to happen if you're going to be the success that you hope to to be by moving here if your life is going to change if it'll be okay and you meet a group of people who are going through the same fears and have the same anxieties right and uh, helping each other navigate this space of being othered and even being more othered because you're an immigrant but the interesting thing though um about my mom's experience was she grew up um, in South Pasadena and where she grew up, um, there was a lot of other people of color and some other immigrant families. And those immigrant families were, um, Filipino and the immigrant experience is universal. And I think that, um, people forget that. So the, the, what my mom was going through was the same thing that her Filipino friend was going through because their parents were both just immigrants and it had nothing to do with the racialized component of it. And I think that if people saw that more through the immigrant lens or didn't use the immigrant lens as an excuse to be racist, well, there could be so much more cultural exchanges and so much more comfortability between groups because there's so many similarities just in, in general. So I really like what she said because she pointed at that immigrant thing, but um, the reality is there's the immigrant experience, which I think is universal no matter what race you are to a certain degree and then there are the people that use that experience to say to not even ever interact with anyone of any other race and that creates fear and suspicion and weirdness so yeah i thought my brother was black um because he had a lot of black friends all i saw was his black friends is all he hang hung out with so i would go to school and say hey I have a black brother, you know, trying to make friends. Like, I was so adamant. And then, like, my That's mom... an interesting way to make friends. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, okay. And I was, like, like eight or something. Right. I was like, yeah, my brother is black, so I was like, 
cool. Like I never had any bad ideas about black people. It wasn't until I started like really watching the news that I learned, oh my gosh, like, you know, they're getting stereotyped for things that I've never even seen a black person do. I think some of my assumptions about Asian Americans are that they aren't necessarily fond of black people, or if they're not, they, they don't have any feeling one way or the other. They just prefer to um, be with their own. Not that I fault them, because that's how a lot of different races are. COVID-19 has hit my community harder. <laughs> In, in different ways, okay, because because COVID has hit the African American community hard in regards to us as patients. Mm -hmm. We are getting it the most. We are dying from it the most. I think it's hit us in that way, but it's hit Asian Americans in the way that you all are experiencing a lot of overt racism that I think a lot of you may not have experienced before. Mm -hmm. I really liked what Taylor had to say um, in this when she basically was just like, yeah, like she broke it off really well where she's like, we've been hit hardest just statistically with the death rate by our community, but you guys have hit hard been hit hardest by the overt racism. And I like how she added that you're probably not used to feeling. And that's so true because for as long as at least any of the people who are my contemporary or even a generation or two generations above have experience who are Asian, in this country is being having quote unquote positive stereotypes or being pushed and held and tokenized as like uh, model minorities. And I think COVID really kind of um, started to show a lot of Asian people that you're not like white people and investing in whiteness always leaves you bankrupt because as soon as something happens, it could and the pandemic was instant as soon as something like that happens it's that simple for your perceived privilege to be taken away do you know what i mean and so i think that taylor really broke it off in this um whole conversation um it's crazy that i know her so weird um walked by me and started saying something to me and i didn't hear him necessarily it was an older black man and he called me some racial slurs and had alluded to me being Asian, me being dirty and eating bats, and I'm the cause of COVID happening. Now, I like that she said that because um, that's where what I've been seeing a lot online in terms of when the Stop the Asian Hate campaign was really raging, um, and, you know, videos were popping up of hate crimes that were happening to Asian people and all of that, which was just insanity due to COVID. But a lot of Asian people would, um, you know, um, kind of go in an anti-black kind of way when it came to this, because obviously certain people attacking over overwhelmingly it was white people, of course, because they're just a majority. And of course, they're racist as hell. But um there was a lot or a few instances, especially the ones on caught on camera that were black people doing it. And, you know, I saw something where, you know, that was, you know, maybe like one percent of the hate crimes. But that was those were the hate crimes that were broadcast by network news and social media the most, which I think is poignant. Um, I think that's really interesting. But her pointing that out is um also gave way for a lot of Asians to be super anti-black openly. Um, and I thought that was just so lame because it's like, okay, that, not saying get over it, but that's somebody that in a singular circumstance, that doesn't say, that doesn't mean we all aren't riding for you and we aren't, aren't all aren't sharing mutual aid funds and trying to support the movement. So characterizing us by somebody who, you know, was dumb as hell and prejudiced as fuck is not true because we don't do the same to you. And I think that's the main thing, but I'm glad she brought that up. Um, but it, it was interesting, sociologically speaking, why were those images and videos of black people doing the hate crimes the ones that were circulated the most? Think about it. Think about what the goal is for this whole video. Think about it. 
So it says, I face more racism from the opposite side than I do from white people. And only the black girl with the braids came up. Just me. <laughs> um, I think it's true for me, but it's, it's, I think I'm a special case given the fact that the industry I work in. I work in the tech industry. I face a lot of just rude comments, ignorant comments, and just um, unnecessary things that are said to me by Asian people. I've had um, a few Asian coworkers that uh, told me that the way that I talk is inappropriate that my tone and my voice is inappropriate for the workplace and I need to change that. I need to become more Americanized. And he said, don't worry, nobody else is gonna tell you that, but I'm gonna tell you that. And I get that more from my Asian coworkers and Asian managers than I do my white coworkers. Yeah, I feel like that's really interesting because that's an experience unique to her due to her industry, which is overwhelmingly white and Asian and um... Wow, that was well said. I really, that, uh, and I didn't even think about that because it's like overwhelmingly to me, it's like because it's all connected to white supremacy, white people are naturally always the the default, terrible, evil villain in the story. <laughs> but in that case, I can see, um, yeah, that's really interesting. Also work in, you know, I wor worked at a tech company before and I'm always a manager in position and to have somebody talk to someone like that, I, I don't think our community as a whole, this is not the representation, I don't think they would give the same respect that you guys are giving. And um, it's not right, mm, mm. It's, it's not right. The fact that you can do that and give us the benefit of the doubt is um, so kind. <laughs> it's, um, I don't think we deserve it. And um, yeah, I overall think that Asian communities are very racist, not only racist against just there are a lot of inner racism. There's a lot of Southeast, oh, uh, yeah. South and East uh, racism that's prevalent. There's clear black, white, there's racism a lot. But the fact that we are getting the benefit of the doubt that I know that you guys have never been able to get from this culture and you guys are still having the compassion to do it. Really, I thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> he got so, that got emotional so fast. You guys, he's so sweet and sensitive. I like that. I like a man who cries. Um, um, I feel like what he said pointed out a lot. Because what do we get from hating people back as black people? What does that give us? You know what I mean? Like, I think we often give the benefit of the doubt. There's obviously a few of us who don't. I mean, you know. I'm one of those people who do um, because I understand how this system is constructed, especially for other POC and how they're socialized. Like think, think back to the first video of how so many Asian American immigrants came to be in America after the Immigration Act of 1965. So they're coming in and already being programmed to be against us. It's about the socialization. It's about the education level. And it's about this um, huge push in American society to be very individualistic and nuclear family focused that you don't really spend the time to get to know your neighbor, period. But to get to know your neighbor that's black no, you know what I mean? And so I think that, um, you know, um, we're taught to give the benefit of the doubt, but most people are not who are not black. And I think that um, it shows in how we interact with other people and the love that we try and exude in our culture. We are very accepting people. We are very loving people. And I know that to be true. Um you know, a lot of people say that. Talk about, talk to any white person who's ever been to a black church before. You know what I mean? Or I'm, I'm open to educating. It's just the simple fact that I know that it was, construct this was constructed this way not by you and you're miseducated. You know what I mean? I think it's a very important discussion to have, um, especially I think as an Asian American. I've seen a lot of hypocrisy come from our side um, and I think I wanted to um, have an opportunity to talk in a uh, safe form about it. It said Asian Americans are more advantaged than black Americans. Well, we all agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, um, I kind of think um, Asian American privilege is white privilege. I think a lot of my success and opportunities that I got was purely be because of how people judge my skin color and ethnicity. They thought I was smart. They thought um, I spoke eloquently. They thought I fit a minority profile into their culture, whatever it may be. But I've never had a negative stereotype, which means I have an inherent advantage, which is the whole principle of white privilege, right? So I think I'd be very disingenuous in saying that I didn't get a lot of my successes or opportunities just because of, I'm Asian. Yeah, I feel like there was that whole thing of good and bad stereotypes is really important. I would love some of those like good stereotypes. <laughs> like when everybody thinks you're a thug or everyone thinks you're ghetto or everyone thinks yeah. that you're somebody's baby mom, especially the age I'm at now, mm -hmm. like that are all negative stereotypes and does affect me. It does affect me in the workplace. I would love to work like walk into the workplace and everyone assume, oh, she's the smartest in the room, or she went to a UC, or whatever good stereotype that is associated with Asian people. I would love to have that. And that's an advantage in some way because it allows you to have more opportunities where someone's making a quick judgment and they say, okay, who I'm going to work with. If they don't know you, they may pick that Asian person because there's 100%. already those assumptions that's already there. I would echo that. I definitely think it's based off of skin tone. Yeah, if you're East Asian, Chinese, Taiwanese, Korean, you have, in my opinion, more advantages than someone who's Filipino. Like my mm -hmm. friend who was Filipino told me, oh, we're the black people of Asians. Yeah. Uh, so oh. it's, but I do think that Asian Americans have more advantages than black Americans because simply you all didn't have to go through the system, systemic oppression that African Americans have had to go through due to slavery. Yeah. Absolutely. I think the Asian Americans that wouldn't be here right now and that would disagree are the people who bought into the model minority myth mm -hmm. because that was basically brought on to us as a way to somehow align us with whiteness in the sense mm -hmm. that yeah we're accepted for because we're smart and we were hard working and whatnot and although that's not tr that's all true right. it's also saying you're a good minority, therefore there must be a bad minority exactly. right yeah. and that's so that's, that's wedging point. when they want us we're then on their we're here, side. Right. And then when they don't want us, then they push us then aside. Yeah. I think because there's such anti-blackness in the Asian community, even coming from Asia, there's already a bias when you have these first, second generations. There's already that bias there. Yes. But then when they come here, they're taught that black is bad, white is good, don't be like these people. So you're already kind of forming this enemy type of uh, I'm trying to fit in. Yeah, you're, you're forming an enemy based on what you're hearing. Well, I've even heard Asian people say uncool things to me because they're like, oh, you're black, so you're going to steal. So they'll follow me or this look at me, and I'm like, am I going to steal 25 cents gum? Like, I'm not going <laughs> to risk it all for that, right? So I think it's just like that frustration of you see my skin as dirty, and you also see my culture as dirty, and then people come over here and you start pressing me in my country that I helped build, my family helped build. Mm -hmm. Like, it's that anger that's kind of there, and I feel like that adds to the tension. Wow, that was surprisingly, that was a good little segment, but what she said I think was really poignant, and I just want to hop on that really quick because I think that's where the tension is. And I think she hit the nail on the head. One, because it's like, why are you hating on us? You don't understand that you are us. You're running away from the fact that you are not white. And in that country, that's not good. Um, and you're experiencing that for the first time. And you want us black people to be up in arms next to you when we've experienced really, really fucked up things at the hands of Asian people. Never forget, one of the cops that was watching that man on George Floyd's neck was Asian. Did he step up and help? No, he was also a cop, which is like, you know, and so huh, I think that um, she hit it on the head where, with our side and our frustration and why there can be such tense conversation between our two groups at times, because it's like, okay, you're already indoctrinated. <clears throat> There's colorism all over the world. There's colorism in Asia. We know that. But you're already indoctrinated based on that and also based on how you're treated in this country versus us and how white people condition you to believe that aligning with them is the best bet. We're the worst people in this country. Look at them complain all the time. They don't got shit. They will never be shit. They're dirty. They're lazy. They're all of the things. When, um, you know... Um, and and you're taught to align with whiteness and you buy into that. And so... When you come here through the Immigration Act that we helped pass 
for your ass to come here, okay? And then you're assuming that we're stealing or you're putting those negative black stereotypes on us in terms of assumption when you have no black friends, you don't talk to any black people, your parents wouldn't be happy if you brought home a black person home. You're told not to do that, right? And you're going to press us in a country that my gen my my lineage helped build from the ground up i think that's where the tension is she really nailed it on the head this is <clears throat> this one's hard cuz i think the piece is due to the fact of not talking yeah <laughs> I don't, I don't think it's uh, due to anything really but that. It's the fact that that's them over there and we're over here. Why does this keep happening? Here. Yeah, I think we coexist peacefully, but that doesn't mean we we're like, progressing yeah. together yeah. because we both are just minding our own business. Yeah. But we really shouldn't be because we're both living in the same society that is oppressing both of us in yeah. different ways. Mm -hmm. Why can't we open that door, have this conversation, and try and help each other as far as like helping each other's businesses, you know, working together? We never really see that, and I'm hoping for more of that, honestly. I really like that because it's true. It's like pointing out the fact that we both, as a culture, know how to mind our own fucking business, but that's not the same as actually creating bonds of solidarity, reaching across the aisle, and growing together through cultural exchange and understanding, and supporting each other. That was well, well said. The culture that we're living in right now, everybody's trying to act like we've progressed so far beyond because we're seeing all this stuff on social media yeah. or there's certain things that are not socially acceptable. But um, th th there's a problem with that because if we don't start talking about things that are potentially harmful that we have within us towards our neighbor, right? I can't love my neighbor effectively if, I don't, if I'm not honest with them. Mm -hmm. I think we need to start having more of these controversial conversations and being able to say, okay, you know what? I might have an offensive perspective, but at the end of the day, I need to get over that hump. So I need to be honest with you about some things that I might have had in my life and in my past so that not only can I progress, but I can grow. This has been such like an eye opener just to me, because uh, y'all y'all some dope people for real. <laughs> like like y'all are cool. I'm blown away um, by the compassion that y'all continue to have, and I wish all Asian Americans and Asians in general can learn from that. And I truly mean that from the bottom of my heart. What's up? Okay. Oh, <laughs> that ended so well. Also, he's a big crybaby, which I like. That's a cute, but um. I like what the black guy said to wrap it all up, where it's like, we need to keep talking and having these conversations. Everyone wants to be so PC. Everyone wants to come out and be on top and know the right thing to say. The issue is if we're ignoring talking about race with people who are racist to us, if we're ignoring talking about politics with people because it's impolite if we're ignoring these big controversial conversations all the time then we don't really end up having a real good foundation for anything and definitely not a good foundation for creating solidarity so i think there are aspects of cancel culture call out culture wokeness um just pc culture and stuff that i appreciate because you know saying slurs is obviously terrible but what I hate is that it's created this culture of shying away from being honest, I think. And honesty is the best way for you to grow and to learn and to see how you show up in the world and in the space. Um, but yeah, wasn't this great? I hope this. I hope you guys like this video. I really enjoyed it. I wanted to add my spin and talk about Asian and Black relationships. I am in a relationship with a Filipino man um love him very much but um and have been for four years at this point but this is an interesting thing and it's important to talk about and it, it's uncomfortable and it's not sexy and it's not fun but it's like we got to get over this hump guys because we us together are dope we have the best fucking food ever the best seasoning, the best cultural practices. Like, dude, come on. It's a it's a match made in heaven in terms of creating solidarity, creating bonds and connection. And I hope 
that one day we'll see more of it. But anyway, I guess without further ado, all I have to say is Black Lives Matter and Free Palestine until it's backwards. Kiss, kiss. Love y'all. Tune in next time.